Hello and welcome to the Whale Hunting Podcast, where we shine a light onto hidden worlds of money and power every week. I'm Bradley Hope, and this week I'm joined by Mitch Prothero, host of Gateway, Cocaine, Murder, and Dirty Money in Europe, a podcast from Project Brazen, and a longtime reporter for Vice, BuzzFeed, and other newspapers around the world. Welcome, Mitch. Thanks for having me. Back talking about some of our favorite stuff. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, we're having you back on. Obviously, we made this amazing podcast with you, Gateway, and um, the central kind of bad guy that was so scary that some of the podcast team didn't want their name on the podcast <laughs> was Ridwan Tagi. He just got sentenced to life in prison, but maybe you can just take it from there. Who's Ridwan Tagi? Just kind of bring us up to speed. Ridwan Tagi, is, I think he's 46 years old right now. He might have turned 47 in the last few months. He was from a family of like a Moroccan Dutch uh, hashish smugglers and traders that worked the Strait of Gibraltar and also had connections up in Amsterdam and different towns across the Netherlands where he had basically grown up. In the 2010s, there was a big shift in the cocaine markets uh, having to do with like the, the peace treaty in Colombia and things like that. And Ridwan was one of these guys, and there's been a handful that over that period really took control of Europe's cocaine trade. The mafias involved had usually been like logistics people uh, going back decades. But starting around 2013, 14, these groups, particularly out of like Antwerp and Rotterdam, dominated by Moroccan clans that had come to Europe, you know, in, in the 60s. These guys really took over the international cocaine trade, at least for Europe, as, as the European market kept growing. So Ridwan actually became sort of the man behind the scenes of a lot of this. And for years, nobody could even really print his name or figure out what his role was behind the scenes. And he was working out of both Morocco and Dubai. And whenever his name would pop up, those people seemed to get murdered. And this is really what brought into focus both the problems the northern ports were having uh, in terms of just massive amounts of cocaine pouring in over the last 10 years. Each year they set records now. It's, it's almost commonplace. And Tagi sort of declared war on anybody who would mention his name to the police and then anybody that might testify against him. And then it expanded to enemies, real and perceived. And he essentially put together what they called a killing machine of uh, various biker gangs and assassins and things like that. And they were out there killing people. Uh, he's been convicted for half a dozen murders. There's probably another dozen he's suspected of, as well as tons of other attempted murders, and running you know, a huge cocaine cartel out of Dubai that had international connections with a bunch of other mafias. So that's the back of the envelope, Ridwan Tagi. The, the world of drug smuggling, is, it sounds kind of exciting and dangerous, and I'm sure it is in many different ways, but ultimately it's kind of like an admin job, right? It's kind of an import-export job, but how do you become a kingpin in Antwerp? Like, what, what did he have to do to get to where he got? Well, uh, Tagi follows a common move up the food chain, uh, and this is something that we found while doing Gateway, was that a lot of these guys like Tagi, and there's some others that have been indicted by Belgium, and these guys are basically living openly in Dubai or the United Arab Emirates. One might be living in Turkey. And they're moving metric tons, you know, every month through the ports of Antwerp and Rotterdam. Uh, one of the ways these guys got there was through a strange confluence of events. The low-level gangsters from the immigrant communities and stuff, or what had been low-level gangsters from Europe's uh, immigrant communities, these guys had been people that would pull cocaine off of containers on behalf of bigger mafias. They would transport from, let's say, Antwerp to Frankfurt or, you know, throughout Northern Europe as distribution or wholesale distribution, doing security and things like that. And these guys used to get paid per kilo of cocaine. Usually it's about $3,000 per kilo for helping get it through the port and into the market. About 10 years ago, some of these groups started getting paid in cocaine because it was easier and cheaper for the cartels to do it that way. But at the same time, the market in Colombia was becoming sort of much less centralized and wide open because of the peace deal in 2016. And as a result, guys like Ridwan Tagi, a bunch of different Albanians and Serbs, these guys were able to set up their own supply lines from South America. And that's when they became huge overnight. And so when you look at somebody like Tagi, 
he saves up, we used to joke, 25,000 euros. You save up to get a kilo of cocaine. You take that kilo of cocaine, you flip it into two kilos of cocaine. And within five years or so, you can be a millionaire living in Dubai. It's that quick. And it's that much explosion. There's no like tech stock that gives a better return than, than cocaine. It's, it's really almost the purest form of capitalism I've ever seen. So he, he does that. He, double, he keeps doubling down and he keeps doubling his money. But I guess the problem with the drug world is it's, it's underground. So the only way you can stay on top is through violence, right? So a bit, I guess Ridwan is sort of what he became known for as being the most violent of them all. Yeah. And, you know, you're absolutely right in that because it is the purest form of capitalism, but it's only regulated by the market and then your own enforcement. There's extremely limited ways to peacefully resolve conflicts between suppliers. And we've seen wars start because the police will seize, you know, customs will seize kilos or hundreds of kilos from, from a shipping container, not announce it, and then listen to everybody try to blame each other so they can try to figure out where it came from. And this has backfired before and started gang wars where people have died. <laughs> Turns out the police had it all the time. So what people told me was there's a way to stay really small and sort of make a living, primarily doing retail and wholesale uh, deliveries, you know, to, to consumers. And you don't need to keep much stock and you work with people that you sort of know well and you're not a particular threat. So you're OK. But when you start doing what Toggy did and really exponentially building up your empire, yeah, you've got to protect it. Now you've got millions in cash you know, that you've got to move from one place to another. You've got cocaine worth millions or tens of millions uh, that you've got to store until it can be moved. So you've got to hire people to protect that stuff. The chances of getting ripped off get exponentially higher the more people that you bring in and the more money that's going around. And that's when you get somebody like Ridwan who starts getting a little paranoid and delusional that everybody's out to get him and that he's got to stay on top. And more so than we've seen from most gangsters, he really went nuts. Uh, he was killing people that had sold him mobile phones just in case those phones had turned out to be bugged, you know, uh, Old friends of his he was hunting down because he'd heard rumors they were speaking to the police. And he had this obsession with killing the old organization that he'd sort of replaced in a gang war where he was pursuing low-level members of this group that he'd already pretty much beat out all across Europe, all across Morocco, you know, just constantly trying to kill them. And so this really made him so much higher profile and so much more dangerous because at some point he then starts going after lawyers and threatening judges and taking sort of an assault onto the, the actual state of the Netherlands. But what you said about it being kind of a really boring industry when people aren't trying to kill you, it's true. It's just shipping logistics. It's you, you get it onto a container, you get that container to Europe, you get it off that container, you get it onto trucks, and you get it out to your customers. It's Amazon, basically. And one of the things that makes it such a powerful industry is, and this is something that I didn't realize when I first started studying it, is the price of cocaine is static. Everybody knows its value. And it can be unloaded almost anywhere. It can hold for at least five years if you treat it right, probably even longer. And so it's in some ways a perfect commodity. One of the comparisons a cop made uh, when we were talking about this was, I guess back in the day on the... On the uh, fringes of the Roman Empire, they would pay the legionnaires in salt. Everybody recognized what salt was. Everybody needs salt. So you didn't have to mess with different gold or different interpretations of, you know, when these guys were so far away from the center of Rome. They weren't getting paid in money. They were getting paid in a commodity that had recognizable value that could be stored and sold at any time for a consistently known set of money. That's a kilo of cocaine in the modern world now. So in some ways, I think of it that way. So, so as these guys are, are building their empires, there's like millions and then maybe tens of millions and maybe hundreds of millions of dollars sloshing into this underground uh, organizations, right? And I guess one of the things I was always fascinated by is how that money started to transform these cities, these kind of classic European tourist spots like, like Antwerp. And I think at one point, one of the kind of phrases was Antwerp is the new Miami. Could you kind of give some color on that? Yeah, of course. From what I can tell, actually, the biggest problem for your average cocaine lord is moving the cash, getting paid and getting the cash back and getting the cash into the economy. 
you know, transporting cocaine. If you lose the cocaine on a container, you can just send more cocaine. It's sort of built into the whole process, whereas bringing the cash back is very different. So what we found is one of the reasons why Antwerp took off so spectacularly, and it is probably the single biggest port of entry for drugs, maybe in the world, it's definitely the single biggest port of entry for cocaine in Europe. One of the reasons is just because the city and the culture of you know Flanders is almost dedicated to this type of operation. They have a huge port, a huge fruit port. So fruit ports are particularly important to the cocaine traffickers because fruit can't sit around waiting to get scanned. Ecuador's banana trade right now is, is one of the most you know commonly used ways in. So you're a guy, let's say you're hiding in Dubai, you're moving from your partners in Peru and Ecuador to Antwerp where your gang gets it off of the containers and then you move it out to the clients and to the rest of Europe using the amazing EU inside Schengen uh, logistics and infrastructure. At that point then, you've got to pay for that entire organization that you're looking at. And to do that, you've got to move money around. And so we found that Antwerp was particularly liked because it's a diamond bourse. It's got like Europe's largest diamond bourse, maybe the second biggest in the world. It's got a huge gold market. It's always been a port city. So it's got a long tradition of smuggling and sort of the infrastructure of lawyers and real estate people and bankers that you need to really run an international conglomerate. And then when you double down with what Dubai and the United Arab Emirates can offer in the, this regard, you know, this becomes what it is. is it's, it's a huge way of moving money. And that's where these places tend to pop up and what seems to be the most valued aspect of being a cocaine trafficker is being able to work with your clients where everybody can get paid relatively quickly and safely and have people guarantee the deals. And so there's this whole infrastructure that's built up around that. And one of the ways, as you said, is development. We've seen that particularly in places like Albania and Morocco, uh, Dubai to a certain extent. And even, you know, the Netherlands and Belgium is people need to launder that cash. It's got to go into the legal economy and then come back out so it can be spent. And so there's an infrastructure that's all around that. I would hear about guys in Amsterdam or they'd get busted, you know, and these are just normal business people or normal workers who had a garage in their backyard of their semi-detached house in Amsterdam. And they're renting that out for 3,000 euros a month to somebody to occasionally store stuff in it. Little things like that. That's where it's all over the place. And these aren't like kingpins. This guy's making 3,000 euros a month. But it's a substantial amount of money for them. And what you see is that's how the corruption can happen. You can find a cop for 50,000. You can blackmail or bribe port workers. You can work illegally with gold and diamond bourse people to move money quietly back and forth between Dubai. And so the whole thing tends to rot the system a little bit. It's just this body that's sort of rotting the legitimate economy. And the legitimate economy really likes the money, even if it doesn't like where the money comes from. So I think there's always a tension uh, in enforcement when it comes to cash. But I guess in this case, the law enforcement had to kind of take a much bigger stance because it was becoming so bloody. And some of these murders were so high profile. Could you just talk about some of these most prominent killings? Yeah, it had been, there, there'd been a raging what they called the Moroccan Mafia gang war. And that had been raging for about 10 years. And it's one of the most difficult to parse out complicated uh, series of betrayals and fights and stuff. And a lot of people got killed in that. Taki came out at the top of that. So there was already this knowledge that there was sort of violence going on across Spain, across Belgium, across Amsterdam. People were getting killed. But it had stayed in the as they call it, the cocaine milieu. It had stayed inside the businesses. Normal people weren't really getting killed. So law enforcement was interested, but they were having sort of a hard time nailing down exactly what was happening. And to his credit, Tagi had really stayed out of the public eye through either being discreet or through threats for years before the police even found out who he was. The first reference we could find to him, he'd been at it for a few years, and the first reference we could find was mentioning him in a notebook by a reporter friend of mine uh, who'd heard from a source in late 2015 there was some guy named Ridwan Taghi. He said that he makes the whole underworld shiver, which was one of our favorite lines from Gateway. 
And he did. He was terrifying the underworld. But nobody outside of this knew who he was until people started finding out who he was and those people would get targeted. So you saw a biker gang shoot an RPG into a magazine the day before printed Tagi's name for the first time. A car was smashed into a newspaper office and lit on fire in front of the Telegraph. Nobody was killed, but in the Netherlands, this is insanity. And so people started getting very concerned. Then as the cases progressed against Tagi, he became more and more paranoid and he started going after the establishment. He started killing lawyers that were advising witnesses against him. And I think that was the first killing of a lawyer involved in a major case in the Netherlands, at least in 50 years, if not ever. And it started spreading from there. He was trying to kill witnesses, witness families. He ended up killing perhaps the most famous journalist in the Netherlands, Peter de Vries, who had had a long career as sort of a true crime rock star sort of swaggering reporter. He had taken on an advisory public relations role to a crown witness that ended up being key to putting Toggy away. You know, De Vries was murdered in the middle of Amsterdam on the street in, you know, summer afternoon. And the other two lawyers, you know, spent more than two years living in safe houses. So this is when it really popped up and the Dutch realized this isn't a bunch of immigrants quietly killing each other in warehouses over screwed up cocaine deals. This is an attack on our actual society here. And I still wonder whether or not they fully recognize the attack in some ways. It seems like they've been a little reluctant to truly call it what it is. One of the great stories in the podcast was the story of Nabil B, which we also turned into this kind of really fun 10-minute animation. Could you talk about Nabil B and how his case really was the undoing of Ridwan? Yeah, uh, Ridwan undid himself in a lot of ways because he was constantly plotting to kill off different people. And so he needed people to do that for him. Nabil was a good friend of his. Uh, they'd been working together for, I think, 10 years. Uh, Nabil's a younger guy, he looked up to Tagi, who had run sort of a, a smaller street gang in the 90s, selling hashish and stuff like we were saying. And Nabil was one of his guys. And Nabil was basically told to arrange the murder of somebody. And he did, and the wrong guy got murdered. And it was a friend from a family that was just as scary as Tagi. <laughs> and Nabil realized that either his boss was going to kill him for having blown the assignment, or the family of his friend was going to kill him for killing their kid. And Nabil panicked and basically walked into a Amsterdam police station with a gun, which is my favorite part of it. His, his proper actual arrest charge was carrying a weapon into a police station. But he walked in and said, you know, I, there's this guy, you don't know anything about him really, he's trying to kill everybody, he's gonna kill me. And the police said, okay. And the Netherlands doesn't have a huge history of what we call cooperating witnesses in their legal system. It's pretty rare. So they didn't really know how to handle it. And they hadn't really been in this position, particularly with such a bloody gang. And that's what kicked off a string of murders, starting with Nabil's brother, Nabil's lawyer, uh, Peter de Vries, who is then Nabil's confidant and press relations guy, and his two lawyers who cooperated on the Gateway Project with us. They were living in safe houses with 24-hour protection. You know, even just to interview them, we could talk by phone, but to even properly interview, I think it took over two months to set up. And that was just because they were literally being hunted. And everybody at that stage knew it wasn't just a bullshit threat. You know, they'd already killed the previous lawyer. They'd already killed the public relations guy. It wasn't a theoretical problem. And so, you know, that's why they held the trial and they're still going to be holding future trials in a warehouse surrounded by Dutch commandos called Zebunker. So, you know, they've had to militarize in a way to protect prosecutors, judges, police, witnesses, lawyers. It's an amazing situation in some ways. And, and Ridwan was kind of sitting in Dubai during all this. He's not on the streets of, of the Netherlands at this point. I guess a lot of criminals have found that Dubai was a, a safe haven for them where they couldn't be extradited. But at some point, the crimes might be just too much. And it looks like that's what happened here, right? The, the UAE authorities grabbed him. Hey. The UAE authorities had been asked to pick him up for a long time, and they get asked to pick up a lot of different people. 
the Irish crime group, the Kinahans, Kinahan family, they've got U.S. warrants out for them. And it's almost certain that they're in the United Arab Emirates. And they were there before, and it doesn't seem like they've had any success finding a place to leave to. Uh, some of the biggest traffickers in Antwerp, they live in Dubai. Belgium is constantly sending them uh, requests for extradition. So it depends on the country and the relationship the country seems to have with the UAE and what the UAE might want in exchange for turning a guy over. But in Ridwan's case, his epic screw up was he arranged a murder of a rival, a rival that he didn't even need to kill. It was petty and vindictive. Uh, he tried to kill him in Marrakesh in Morocco. And instead, the son of a federal judge who was friends of the king of Morocco was killed. And at that point, Morocco decided Tagi needed to go. And that really helped, uh, I think, in terms of getting him arrested because the Netherlands, this is a bureaucratic, diplomatic thing. They've accused this guy. The guy is investing millions in real estate and has a you know, UAE residency permit. All right, we'll get around to you know, maybe looking into this. If the king of Morocco calls you know, the royal family in Dubai or the royal family in UAE, that's king to king. And he called and said, I want this guy. And UAE said, OK, come get him. <laughs> and so in a way that you, you really only get on that royal to royal, you know, discussions. And then inexplicably, instead of killing him, the king cut a deal that nobody's really sure about what the terms were for him to go to the Netherlands to face this trial. And so it was sort of a three way extradition. It was very sneaky. Uh, it seems like, though, from between Dubai, Morocco and the Netherlands, he had a series of falls, right? His picture didn't look so good when he got there. He was arrested, technically, by UAE police in his uh, villa, uh, and then immediately handed over for three days to some Moroccan intelligence officials that had flown in from Morocco. It doesn't look like that three days went well. He referred to it a couple of times in prison, saying, basically, I got the shit beat out of me for days. There is a picture of him with like a boot print on his face from that time when he was sort of brought in for his booking photo in the Netherlands. He'd clearly been roughed up. And that's why we all kind of like at the time it was believed that Tagi was not going to come out of that situation. He killed the f child of a friend of the king. The king of Morocco had him in custody in a place that wasn't going to ask a lot of questions. And, uh, you know, they still managed to send him up there, but he just didn't look great when he was handed over. So this the a bunker. Did you spend time there during the trial? And, and like, yeah, did I mean, you have a kind of an encounter with uh, our man Ridwan? I managed to go to a couple of uh, different trial dates. And you have to understand this trial took place, uh, hundreds of hearings, uh, 8,000 pages of testimony. So I got to go to like some of the last ones. And yeah, one of them was one of the few times that Ridwan Taghi, Nabil B, all of the lawyers that were living in safe houses, everybody was collected in one room together. And uh, the way that they did the trial, the media is sort of behind glass at the back of the room. And, you know, at one point it was clear that Taghi had looked around and recognized that there was a new person sitting in the media section because, you know, Netherlands is a small place and they had the same four or five reporters that would go every day. And he knew who these guys were. And he noticed me. I was told then that the court was obligated to give him my information to the legal team, that they had the right to know who was in the trial. And that seems legitimate, but that was the moment also when, in terms of security and stuff on the project, we hadn't been that concerned prior to that. Tagi didn't know who I was. There was like, you know, a lot going on in his life. But at the moment that the court had to turn over basically a copy of my passport and my personal information to Tagi's legal team, you know, that put sort of a chill on things. We started trying to wrap up the, the podcast pretty quickly after that, but <laughs> yeah. the best we could. One of the characters in that bunker setting was this lawyer for Ridwan, Inez Weski, who looks like she came straight out of the Adams family. Can you talk about her and, and what ended up happening with her? I mean, these are the kind of things you just can't make up, but I would like to love to hear. No, you, you really can't. And because it was the same, it wasn't even, she wasn't even the first one. So Ridwan, once he was extradited, was held under the most secure conditions, you know, by himself, unable to speak to anybody outside of the prison. And people were still getting killed. Peter de Vries was killed, we assume, on Ridwan Taghi's orders. He's been closely connected to it. And he managed to do it from complete isolation. 
in prison. So this was scaring people. Tagi was supposed to be off the street and people were still getting killed. It turns out his cousin was a member of the bar and had the legal right to visit with him as a lawyer. So that was one of the ways that people thought Tagi was getting out information. His actual lawyer, as you said, is a famous human rights lawyer, Inez Wesky, and her father had been a human rights lawyer. In fact, it's her family business, her, her children are lawyers. Uh, and what they really specialize in is representing deeply unpopular people, particularly even in war crimes. So Inez had represented Charles Taylor, the dictator of Liberia, and his genocide trial, or his ICC trial. And so she's a well-respected, well-known member of the bar. She does have an intimidating appearance. She's extremely goth, but, uh, you know, is considered a top flight lawyer. Last year, we came across the trial got thrown into disarray. And Inez was accused and jailed, I think, for 40 days for questioning on suspicion that she had been smuggling out messages on the behalf of Tagi as well. And there was a lot of speculation. Why would she do that? And I will say it was never proven one way or another that that you know, is absolutely the case, but it was a deep suspicion by the prosecutors. And, uh, you know, there was some speculation that maybe Tagi had basically threatened her into moving information to other members of his gang once he lost his ability to communicate through his cousin, the attorney. But as a result, she was removed from the trial. Uh, Tagi claimed he was representing himself by the end and that he didn't trust lawyers anymore. But through a source, apparently the first thing he said to the prosecutors when he arrived from UAE was, let's just put me in jail for life and save everybody the hassle. Of course, the Dutch said, no, we should go through all the procedures. But so that's where we are now. I mean, he's now sentenced to life in prison. But I guess if I was the Dutch authorities, I would still never feel safe. I mean, you know, you never know what this guy could, could pull off. He's kind of the scar face of our time. At this stage, there's really nothing that Tagi wouldn't do to get out or even just get revenge. He's proven that, you know, like he's vindictive enough just to want to shoot somebody, even if there's no benefit. Uh, that is a widespread concern. People in the around the case have been almost dreading the sentencing because now the case is over. People aren't going to pay as much attention to it. And there's been widespread speculation that like in the next few months or even six months after, key people involved in the case could get killed. Uh, even as recently as a year and a half ago, he was known to be communicating with other inmates. There was a possibility and terrible concern that he was going to try to kidnap the crown princess of the Netherlands. And these were after these special measures had really been locked down. So maybe they will ease up on him and let him speak to people outside and that could be you know a huge problem uh he does have a network that's remaining the Tagi family is still from what we can tell from emails that have been intercepted they're still running deals to keep the family that aren't in jail you know still working so i don't think the Tagi organization's gone away i think people involved with the case are going to be looking over their shoulders for a long time especially nabil b uh i think of any of anyone on earth and the blb has the, the biggest target on his back right uh, he would definitely have a huge target on his back. I'd say Nabil's damage has already been done to Tagi. So it would have to be killing him wouldn't save you from going to jail. But killing him would make you feel better about the fact he got you put in jail. Uh, Nabil faces 10 years. That was the deal that he came up with with prosecutors. So he's going to have to serve 10 years in prison for his roles in setting up murders and carrying a gun illegally into a Amsterdam police station to turn himself in. Uh, when he gets let out at that stage, one would assume that there would be a proper witness protection program, but that's something that we found the Dutch really haven't done well. And so I think he's very concerned about his long-term safety. His brother's already been killed. The Dutch police initially didn't take the threats against him or his lawyer seriously enough. That's just a matter of record. You know, they're dead. So, you know, Nabil's well aware of all of these things and has complained that he hasn't really been protected like he should. The reason why these, they don't have a great system, and I referenced this before, if you get caught with a, like 100 kilos of cocaine, the Dutch are just going to give you eight years in prison. They're not even going to ask you where you got it. You have the cocaine. We proved you have the cocaine. You are going to go to jail. Whereas in the U.S., you'd be looking at life if you don't tell them where you got the cocaine. 
And then that starts a spiral of revenge and investigations and people giving stuff up. The Dutch skip that step a lot of the time. In fact, I don't know that Tagi will ever go on trial for any of the other things that they know he did because he's in jail for life and they seem to be kind of practical on it. Whereas the U.S. would be trying him through the system for every single accusation, no matter how long he you know, was already going to be in jail. And as a result of this stuff, they don't have great witness protection programs. They don't really have to protect witnesses like, you know, you'd see in the United States. And so that's been a change. They've had to bring in the Italians to a lot of European capitals to explain how they've worked busting down mafia organizations using internal, you know, flip witnesses and that type of thing. Yeah. So now that Ridwan's sentenced to life, now that there's some kind of resolution in the case, where do things stand in Belgium and the Netherlands? Like, is there a new cartel in, in charge? I mean, is everything exactly the same as before, minus Ridwan? Pretty much. Uh, even busier, maybe. What we found is the old style of cartels isn't quite as accurate as it used to be, where you have like a top-down hierarchy and everybody works for one guy. It's we jokingly called it going back to Amazon. It's very much become a gig economy. And you put together deals. You bring in people who have different access to different stuff you need for the deal. Everybody comes together, does one, splits up the money, you know, and then starts putting together another deal. It's it's rarely as top down. That makes it much more resilient. You know, in some ways, I think what the USDEA is trying to do is similar to what they did on the war on terror, which is at some point they realize... You know, you can spend all this time trying to take out bin Laden, but what are you really going to get? Let's spend all of our time taking out, like, mid-management logistical guys so that the organization can't do anything. And that seems to be what the Americans are actually a little bit better at than the Europeans. They, they have more resources to go after huge amounts of money. They can tie together a case that involves Spain, Albania, the Netherlands, you know, and bring all the stakeholders sort of together and work on it. But in general... The way these organizations work, the simple amounts that are going between South America and Antwerp and Rotterdam, at one point during the project, I stopped reading press releases about busts if it was under a metric ton, because there were so many flooding in every day, 200 kilos, 300 kilos, nonstop. I think the UK just found 5.7 metric tons. Uh, one of the biggest busts in history. Earlier in January, the Ecuadorian found 22 metric tons about to get loaded. That's the largest cocaine bust in history. So no, <laughs> you know, taking out Taki doesn't appear to have a tremendous effect. Uh, and that's because these networks are really resilient. The drugs almost play their own role and you're sort of playing a gig economy role in getting them from place to place. When you look at the globalization effect, People simply aren't willing to pay more for sushi and fresh mangoes. That They'd have to or have them less fresh if that's what would require to really checking the containers in Antwerp. I've had cops tell me that if they don't have specific intelligence, they are not catching your metric ton in Antwerp. Every one of those busts comes from a cooperation thing where they knew about it coming across the ocean. They did not randomly stumble on your cocaine. They never do. These guys know that. So this is, you know, it's just this giant globalized system <laughs> and people will replace themselves. I also just love the image. You know, everybody knows about these shipping containers on these giant ships traveling around the world. And the, the, when you listen to the podcast and get into the story, it's clear that every shipping container is like a mystery box. One of them is bananas. One of them's Ikea furniture, car parts, four metric tons of cocaine then another few different things, then torture chamber, then another one might be full of people. Like, it's just a very strange image, you know, to have in your head. Yeah, and we've basically, in the last 20 years, the entire world economy has become these containers. If you can buy whatever you want, whenever you want, at a cheap price, you're going to have more cocaine. It's just, that's the system. Yeah, that's, that's an amazing, thank you for telling us how the world really works. So that now we know and we're we're not better off for it. Actually, now we're we're a lot more worried about how things work. Yeah, well, this is it's the whale hunting thing, you know. I mean, this is this is part of the same ecosystem of like being able to move money and goods and everything around completely freely. It's really good for crime. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Mitch. Good to have you here. That's it for this week. If you want to hear the story of Ridwan Taki from the very beginning, search for Gateway, Cocaine, Murder, and Dirty Money in Europe wherever you listen to podcasts, or go to brazen.fm. 
The best way to stay up to date with whale hunting is to hit follow wherever you listen to podcasts. And you can also subscribe to the Whale Hunting newsletter for updates on the shadowy lives of the powerful and ultra wealthy at whalehunting.projectbrazen.com. Thanks for listening. We'll be back next week for more. Whale Hunting is a production of Project Brazen. It's hosted by me, Tom Wright, and Bradley Hope. It's produced by Megan Dean and Claire Urban. At Project Brazen, Mariangel Gonzalez is our project manager. Ryan Ho is the creative director, with additional design from Andrea Claridge.